That's fine. <laughs> okay. That's fine. Like I so in that way. case, it doesn't really matter when you get it to me. It's something better. Like I can get it to you. Uh, by, by the end of uh, uh, the next week. I can even get it to you by Saturday, but I would still like it. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's, that's fine. fine. That's fine. I'll send out an email to all the people who the papers about their money. Okay, so I should I should wait on you before I send you an email requesting the official extension because I don't have to come to the bridge. Uh, I I I can do a blank. I'm probably just going to sign an extension. Oh, you and you so you can find the bridge. Sorry, sorry. Oh, you're the best. Cool. Okay, thank you. Yeah. 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 Okay, so just uh, two administrative things. Administrative thing one is we'll do the evaluations at the end today. Uh, if you have your laptops, you do them online. I think you know the drill. If you don't have your laptop with you, that's fine. You have, I think, till the end of the exam. Please do them. Um, I would be especially appreciative of any thoughts about format. For next year, I know it won't benefit you, but for future students, like um, I've done this exact same class with one speaker a week. Would you prefer that? Was it a good idea to have a complete rough draft in a year a week? <coughs> Other ways I could structure that, like you just write a thesis summary and then write a critical part afterwards. Anyway, any thoughts you have about the way the class is structured? Uh, I'm very interested in it and would appreciate it. Uh, so the second administrative thing is you should now have back all five, excuse me, five of the six papers, but not, and you already have paper six back, I think. Everyone has paper six back. If you don't have paper five back, you'll get that back by about Wednesday or so. And uh, uh, if you are enrolled in the WR version of the class, uh, I'll be sending out a communication regarding uh, deadlines for the final paper, uh, and that will have all the information about that. Okay, with that out of the way, um, I'm uh, uh, just going to do what I traditionally do, uh, which is not to introduce Josh, I don't need one. but to, he doesn't need an introduction, no. 
but instead to tell you a little bit about why I invited him. So um, I invite, as, as you probably figured out now, I invite different people for different reasons. Uh, and one of the reasons I invited Josh is because he's at the very beginning of his career, but he's someone who created quite a profile for himself before he even entered the legal academy and uh, uh, doing lots of interesting things. So I thought that uh, this would be a really good opportunity for us to see someone at the beginning stage and also it would be a good opportunity for Josh to get his work at and believe me, I've been, I remember being a first year law professor when it was very difficult to get invitations to speak and so I sort of tried to do uh, my part uh, to promote um, uh, beginning stage scholars. So Josh Blackman. Okay. Uh, Professor Solomon, Professor Barnett, thank you very much. Uh, it is indeed an honor to be here. Uh, this is probably my most high-profile speaking gig yet, and hopefully will lead to others. Um, all of you, thank you so much for your reaction papers. I read all of them, and I will try actually work them into my uh, presentation today. Um, you should all consider yourselves very fortunate to have these two guys on your faculty. Uh, you, they're at the vanguard of constitutional law, and I don't say that, I don't say that lightly. Um, the topic I'm talking about today is especially pertinent because this gentleman here was the godfather. Um, he made the president offer he couldn't refuse, and it almost worked. So a lot of what I'll be talking about today relates directly to what Professor Barnett has done, and as well, a lot of the commentary that Professor Solom has written about after the case. So let's just take a step back. The Affordable Care Act case, which you all know, a couple months ago went right down the road. It happened really, really, really fast. It really began November 2009. And over the course of a little bit less than three years, it went through a lot of changes. Constitutional law usually evolves at a somewhat glacial pace. Um, think about Heller, for example. It took almost 20 or 25 years to get a case to the Supreme Court arguing what's the original meaning of the Second Amendment. Um, these things take a while. But there are times when, out of necessity, you have to move quick. Perhaps the best example is Bush v. Gore. In a span of 20 days, Ted Olson came up with an argument about why Florida's recount violated the Secret Protection Clause. That was a very quick thing, and everyone had to jump behind it. Uh, very quickly, you had all the leading Republicans saying, yes, this is an equal protection violation. Forget state rights. But, you know, this is an equal protection violation. And we have these quick changes. NFIB wasn't quite that quick, but it was pretty fast. And when you move fast, you have to make a lot of decisions. And when you make these decisions, you're not always able to uh, fully appreciate and grasp when you're in the moment, because you're always thinking, what do we do next? How do we win this argument? When, when are we going to Richmond? When are we going to Atlanta? When are we going to Pensacola? So what I aimed to do in this paper was take that step back and try and draw several lessons, big, broad lessons that we can appreciate. Um, this was a paper which I contributed to the Chapman Law Review that was a symposium on libertarian thought after the healthcare case. Um, and to preempt a lot of your comments, I'm very much aware that a lot of the ideas aren't fully fleshed out. I had about six weeks to write this. Uh, so it was very short, and I, I fully intend on uh, ramping something to a full-length law review article, or maybe even two articles. Uh, also, I'm actually writing a book about the healthcare cases. So if your comments that this is an overly descriptive article, that's, that's very astute, because a lot of what I'm incorporating was my account of how this case evolved. And the reason why the account of how this case evolved is because this case did not just transpire inside the court. This wasn't about textualism. It wasn't really about originalism. It wasn't so much about precedent. Rather, this was about how the Constitution was changed outside the courts. To quote Jack Balkan, taking ideas from off the wall, putting them onto the wall. And people like Randy Barnett and many others put their lives into this case for three years to work and get this case onto the wall. So I'll start by just giving a brief sketch of the first few lessons, and I'll focus most of my talk on the final lessons. One thing to just stress, um, when I teach in my class, I like to have a lot of interaction. Um, I don't like talking that much, so I have a live chat open. If any of you have a computer, go to that website, today's meet slash GULC, and put some questions there. I can see it right here. And that way, I can kind of weave into my narrative what you're asking about. Tr trust me, it works. I do this with lectures with 70 kids, and it actually works fairly well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you, can, you can type questions there. I don't need to, you don't, need to don't call me, maybe. Um, so let's begin. I think the first two big lessons we should draw from this case is how the entire judicial activism, judicial restraint dichotomy crumbled. Um, and I realize I'm grossly oversimplifying, and I hope you'll indulge me just a bit. But for generations, the general divide was li liberals, progressives, tended to like activist judges. They liked judges who were counter-majoritarian, who can recognize rights, 
who would um, uh, help reinforce representation of those who do not have access to courts. This was something that was very much in the vanguard. And by and large, conservatives in response or in backlash, or however you want to describe it, were the opposite. They said, no, we should have judges who are restrained in the model of Robert Bork, that the Ninth Amendment's an inkblot, and we should not be stepping outside of our shoes to try and uh, uh, find rights. I think a lot of this decay started crumbling when we started getting to the Rehnquist Court in the so-called New Federalism era. With these cases, there was suddenly a realization that, wait a minute, the New Deal Court might have, not might have, but New, New Deal Court erred, and we're not able to fix that, but maybe we can ratchet it back, or, or this far but no farther, so to speak. So conservatives started having a little bit less of a, a hostility to courts engaging the entire Constitution. Um, and we saw this in cases like Lopez, Morrison, Seminole Tribe, Alden v. Maine, um, uh, leading up to Raish, and I'll get to Raish in a few minutes. But conservatives became more accepting of this. Then we had the case in the 2000s. We had Citizens United. We had D.C. v. Heller. We had McDonald v. Chicago. And these all are cases where judges who are conservatives and points by Republicans are more willing to strike down laws. And then we have the dissenters in Citizens United and the dissenters in Heller and the dissenters in McDonald who say, no, 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 we need to defer to the democratic process. And I feel almost like I'm entering a bizarro world with how this reversal of, of roles has, has ensued. Um, the key difference, and of course you're smarter to realize this, is we're talking about different rights. Here we're talking about rights conservatives and libertarians like, like guns and free speech, and in other cases, the rights that progressives have to like, you know, like, like my, from a faction or abortion or, or whatever you want. But I think this helps to hit home that these, the, these talking points, which, which conservatives are so good at, we need restrained judges, we need, you know, who won't legislate from the bench. I mean, it, it doesn't have that much teeth when you get down to it. Um, one small note, and you probably realize this, but if you look at the vote in um, uh, healthcare cases, of course, Justice Roberts was the whatever, however you want to call it. He was also the vote in Citizens United to say we shouldn't go too far. So keep, keep that in mind. Roberts, I don't think, ever fully embraced the new federalism to the extent that maybe O'Connor or Rehnquist did. Uh, I will get to footnote four in a minute. That's a very good point. Um, and we talked about the artificial bifurcation of rights, but we, we will get that in a minute. I think a third lesson is judges and conservative judges. Um, it's been said that during the Bush administration, one of the sole criteria for a judge is, will this person uphold the war on terror? That was it. That, that, that was one of the main focuses. And actually, it's funny, but, but then Circuit Judge John Roberts uh, joined Judge Randolph's opinion in uh, so it's Hamdi or Hamdan, and four days later, he was, he was appointed to the Supreme Court. It was actually, if you actually look at the timing, the opinion is Hamdi or Hamdi, whichever one the D.C. Circuit was, was like four days for the Roberts nomination. And there's speculation that, that that's kind of what Bush was looking for. He wanted a judge who uphold Guantanamo. But the same kind of judge who will be willing to defer to the executive and defer to the legislature is the same type of judge who will twist and turn and do pirouettes so as not to strike a law down. Look at the Chiefs in the Northwest Austin case. He did, you know, like figure eights around the Constitution to get rid of the Voting Rights Act, and they might kill it this term. Look at Citizens United. Roberts was very restrained. He said we should not go too far. Um, and then, of course, look at his, uh, look at his opinion in, this, in the health care cases. Um, did they read it for this class or elsewhere? Have you actually read the Roberts opinion? It's, it's, a, it's jurisprudential jujitsu. That's the only way I can describe it. He's jumping up and down to find ways to save it. But that is the, the mold, and this is what Professor Barnett has called the divide between judicial conservatives and constitutional conservatives, whereas the judicial conservatives in the mold of Robert Bork, J. Harvey Wilkinson, and I'll add John Roberts, Jeff Sutton, Brett Kavanaugh, who are willing to, um, who are less willing to enforce the Constitution as they see it and find easier ways to defer to the democratic process. Um, the other camp would be what, I, what Randy, uh, Professor Barnett would call a constitutional conservative. That is, a judge who is willing to engage the Constitution. Um, if you guys have seen uh, Clark Nilly from the Institute for Justice, he has a really good article about judicial engagement, which, which is more or less a, a way of saying you can't, footnote four, you can't pick and choose what parts of the Constitution you like. I told you I was getting there. You can't pick and choose which parts of the Constitution you want to enforce. Footnote four is an artificial bifurcation of rights, those in the Bill of Rights, those out. One small note, Second Amendment, in the Bill of Rights, Stevens' opinion, Breyer opinion, wrong. People don't, yeah. Breyer actually cited footnote four as saying Second Amendment should not get such protection, even though it's in the Bill of Rights. So take that to the bank. Um, so we actually have this idea that we should engage all provisions of the Constitution. We shouldn't. A 
they, there's a constitution, it has a meaning, we're going to go there. Conservatives confer. Ah. Uh, so I think this leads into what I think is my fourth point, which is really libertarians. And I think it's important to kind of distinguish libertarians and conservatives, um, specifically because conservatives, by and large, have accepted um, have accepted the idea of footnote four Caroline products. They're okay with it because they don't want Roe. I mean, they, they, they don't like they don't like Lochner. They don't like Roe. They don't like substantive due process. So in that sense, um, footnote four is a way for them to save themselves. Um, but we saw in this last case that conservatives, in really the last ten years, have been willing to eschew precedents. They've been willing to strike down, you know, Austin versus uh, Chamber of Commerce and United. They're willing to strike down U.S. v. Miller, which is a seven-year-old press in the Second Amendment. Uh, they're willing to, to perhaps strike down or at least cabin the extent of Wickard and Lopez and Morrison to an extent, or Darby and those other cases. So, so conservatism is not really about keeping old precedents to the extent that you're not like in the John Roberts camp. Because what Roberts did was very tricky, and I'll answer your question in this way. He didn't adhere to the old precedents. He accepted the five votes, I think there were five votes to strike down the mandate as a violation of commerce and the state proper. But what he did was he found a way to save under tax. So Roberts wasn't interested in saving old precedents. He was just interested in not pissing off the, the elected branches and not making people upset. He had a very finite way of accomplishing that, which, which, which fits into this mold. If you look at uh, what, what Judge Sutton did and what Judge Kavanaugh did, they, never, they, they kind of went around the issue to try and resolve it. At least Roberts said, okay, I'll give you five votes because I'm the Supreme Court. Robert, uh, Kavanaugh and Sutton couldn't do that. But Roberts said, we're going to save on this front. Um, when I originally wrote this paper, we saw the presidential election coming up. I said, wow, this might actually impact the next presidential election. Who will be appointed to the Supreme Court? Not so much. So we have at least four more years before we have to worry about this. But I think you can be pretty certain that there's a Republican nominee to the Supreme Court, say to replace Justice Scalia in 20, you know, 2017, or whatever the year happens to be. That candidate will be asked, what do you think about the doctrine of numerical powers? How would you feel about judicial restraint? These are the kinds of questions which I think will be posed. Um, Justice Kagan was asked by Senator Sessions, uh, can the government make me broccoli? Uh, that question didn't go too far, I suppose, when she was being confirmed. So that's really the fourth lesson about libertarians. And on libertarians, I think the most interesting facet is the relationship between libertarianism and originalism. A lot of you put in your comments something to the same effect, that I assume that the Constitution is a libertarian document, or I assume that the Constitution compels libertarian results. Um, Professor Barnett wrote a, he gave the, uh, the Simon lecture at Cato a couple years ago in which he said that the Constitution is a libertarian document and I, I commend it all to, to read. Um, so I, I, won't, I won't defend that position, I think he does it much, much more ably than I can. What I'll say is, I'm not saying whether the Constitution is libertarian or not, what I will say is that by and large most libertarians have hung their hats on jurisprudence of, liber of originalism for the last 10 years, 15 years by and large. It's saying, listen, We've gone too far from the framers' vision of the Constitution, how it was originally understood, and we need to ratchet back to that in some form or another. In the ACA case, that was not the case. Libertarians did not advance originalist challenge, and the reason why is because it wouldn't have gone anywhere. It would have lost. But that also means they didn't advance it, and that's important. I say this is the originalist dog that didn't bark. Why didn't they advance it? And if they didn't advance it here, does that weaken the jurisprudence? A number of you made comments to the effect of, uh, if you sacrifice the methodology for the end, you weaken the, the methodology in the long term. I think there is some, there, there is some salience to that, that, it, that if you uh, arbitrarily pick and choose when you're an originalist, this is what Scalia's alluded to as faint-hearted originalism, you, you in essence are able to um, give firepower to the critics of originalism and say this is just something used to get to a libertarian or conservative end. Um, I don't think that's the necessarily conclusion, and I, I draw a different conclusion in part five of my paper, but I think that that could flow from it. Um, and also a, a cor cor correlative of that is the way popular constitutionalism worked. Um, this challenge was very much geared to the people. This challenge arose at the same time as the Tea Party. This arose in 2010 with the midterm elections. This arose when President Obama was quite unpopular. This channel of the Fox News, Wall Street Journal, talk radio uh, 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 sentiments toward the president's health care law, and it was quite effective. Um, I was at a, uh, in a journalistic capacity, I was at a Tea Party rally on March 21st, 2010, the day the law was enacted. And I was just walking around. I saw a guy with the signs that overturned Wickard v. Filburn. A random guy had a sign that overturned Wickard v. Filburn. I didn't know what that was, so I got to my second year of law school. Uh, you know, you have people sitting around waving around constitutions. Uh, it, 
there was a there was a, a rededication, a Hanukkah, if you will, to the Constitution in, in in this time period, which which was simultaneous. And I think it would create the perfect storm for Professor Barnett and others to to advance this challenge and bring it forward to the Supreme Court. Uh, the timing was was really was really impeccable. Uh, and I think, in by and large, that a lot of libertarians kind of channeled the work of popular constitutionalism that Balkan and Riva Siegel and Bob Post have written about. The way we can speak to the Constitution directly to the people, and the courts react to that. And I think what you saw with opinions by Judge Vince in the district court was actually that, that sentiment that, that the courts were gaining an understanding of how people viewed the Constitution. Um, Vincent's opinion had direct references to the Tea Party and the and Boston tax, or the, the Tea Tax in it. Um, but it's still important to stress that there was not an originalist challenge here, and I think that that is something that needs to be analyzed further. Um, the fifth part of the paper, uh, uh, relates to Professor Salom's Gestalt. How you say? Gestalt. I had actually written something similar over the summer, and then he put it so much better than I did that I kind of reworked the paper. Because I, I also kind of sensed that there was this kind of uh, change in the thinking. And to respond to some of your questions, saying one case is not enough to affect the change, I think that's a fair criticism. Um, but what I will respond to that is this wasn't just one case. This was a three-year process. It's very hard to look at this as just one opinion. Because a lot of stuff has to be done to get there. There were stump speeches, there were politicians. I'm, I've gone through the entire legislative history of this bill, all of it. And there were just so many speeches on the floor about the Constitution, and people talking about the Constitution. And you had President Obama giving a little column lecture saying, not since the Lockman Court has this happened. And you had you know, judges saying that this is, you know, this, is, this is unconstitutional. And you had lawyers, and you had people, and you had, uh, we, had a, we almost had a presidential election based on it, but Mitt Romney wasn't a very good candidate for that. Uh, he had his own issues with health care. But we had, the, <clears throat> we had this focus on the Constitution, and I think this jolted the notion that race ended the new federalism. I think that, that ratcheted back. Because after race, which was, I started law school in 06, so I was relatively a, a young pup. I think, actually you I think you taught race in David Bernstein's class my year. I think that might be possible. Um, but when I was in law school, people saying, oh, race, you know, this is it, it's over. But I think what race represents is a simple recognition that the Supreme Court was taking this, this way of looking at it, saying, listen, we'll go, we'll assume the New Deal is right, we won't like it, but we'll say this far and no further. And in Raich, Scalia, Kennedy said, this is, this is governed by Wicker, so we're not going further. But what NFIB says is, this far, no further applies, this went too far. Mandating inactivity, regulating inactivity is too far and you can't do it. And I think what scares um, opponents of this case the most is not the Chief Justice's, like, you know, whatever tax opinion. It's the fact that now there's a notion that the New Deal settlement hasn't been settled, or the gestalt, that there is this, this question about it. And even if we can't go back and reverse the New Deal, which I don't think will happen, I don't think most people want to happen, there's this notion that if you want to go further, the government has to justify it. And that, the government failed. The Solicitor General was not able to say, what's your principle? Why can you do this? Why? You know, when this case first started, everyone kept saying, oh, this is race, this is wicker, this is easy, and it wasn't. Once they got a couple questions from hostile judges, it, it crumbled, like, like it just fell apart. So then they say, okay, what's our justification? And the government never was able to do that. So I think what you'll see in the next challenge, and who knows what it'll be, broccoli mandates, who knows what it'll be, but this notion that if you want to go further than what the court has gone before, you're going to have to justify it, and it's going to be a substantial burden, just as Kennedy said during arguments, that uh, Solicitor General, you bear a burden because this is a substantial change in relationship between the people and the government. This is your burden, General. This is not the burden of Randy Barnett or, or, or of Alan Gura. This is a burden of the government. And I think that is perhaps the most enduring legacy of this case. Even if the outcome wasn't governed by originalism, even if the outcome wasn't strike down the mandate, the work of originalists to understand the scope of the New Deal went too far, enabled this holding. It allowed us to see we should be compelling the government to say why should these further infringements and individual liberty persist. And that, I think, is the most important lesson to draw from the healthcare case. And thank you much for your time. Okay. Well, up. hit him up. Oh, come on. Yes, sir. I'm kind of begging the question when you talk about engaging the entire Constitution versus engaging parts of the Constitution. I mean, I would, I would assume that, you know, Justice Ginsburg and Justice Breyer, who are definitely would say that they're just as committed as to enforcing the entire Constitution as their colleagues. I mean, I mean it, I'm not sure how exactly you would go about asking a, a point, an appointee 
what you would want to know other than how would you decide a specific case. Yeah, I think, would you put in your question in the, in the reflection papers? I think I saw that question. And I, I made a note of that because it was a good question. I don't think that's true. People who adhere to footnote four of currently products do not want to engage the entire constitution. They'll say if there's some rights which are of a different level of importance that they're treated with rational basis review, and rational basis review is a rubber stamp. So I, I don't think they would say that. In fact, Justice Breyer is extremely hostile to free speech. Read his dissent in Sorrell v. IMS Health, and in other recent cases, he, he, he does not. Read his dissent in the Second Amendment case. He, I've written elsewhere that Breyer treats the Second Amendment as a, as a subordinate right, as like the redheaded stepchild of this constitution. So I don't think that. Um, but, but just as well, I don't think conservatives are willing to fully embrace you know, protections under the Privileges and Immunities Clause. Uh, Professor Barnett just saw at McDonald, and you had four justices who, who just want to turn a blind eye to the PRI Clause. So I don't think any of the, uh, and only Thomas, who I would say is probably the, the, the most committed originalist, the most committed uh, engaged judge, said, listen, this due process stuff is wrong as a matter of original meaning. I'd go back and look at PRI. And that's how, and that was the tie vote in McDonald, by the way. That was the fifth vote for the holding. So the, under traditional rules, that would be the most narrow holding. That would, that would be the rule. But um, Judge Easterbrook had an opinion in Seventh Circuit where he basically said, ah, don't worry about Thomas. It's, you know, it's, it's no, no big deal. It's, it's due process. Because courts have actually looked at this afterwards. But that, that was a very good question. I think it, it would apply just as easily to Scalia and Alito as it would to Breyer and Ginsburg. But I think it's a fair point. Yes, sir. Um, thank you. Um, I, it was interesting to me that it seems to be trying to form narratives um, that looks at NFIB through a particular lens and then left it for the developments that were more. Um, but it seemed that your lens was particularly targeted, and mm -hmm. so it kind of ignored all the. So, what I kind of did in my critique was attempt to look at all the five uh, factors that you. That you uh, that you raised, and then gave plausible alternatives for mm -hmm. differently interpreting them uh, that would give you a completely different outcome of how to look at it. And I think that, and so I guess my first kind of suggestion that mm -hmm. I kind of want to, my words, address those things uh, because they are like seemingly very plausible alternatives. Like Chief Justice Roberts not necessarily being the House by a, a, a judicial conservative, but um, having a much more, um, maybe a less noble um, idea about. You know, about writing in the five Bs, etc. So I kind of raised some of those things, and that, I mean, these are not novel ideas. They were said by mm -hmm. so, but I guess my most part, my what I kind of like to get um, in question form is: Do you really think that there's been a constitutional shift in the popular demographic? I mean, the, the some of the most uh, vibrant or um, or interesting challenges on the constitutional ground um, were came from like the Tea Party. Which is an extremist wing of the Republican Party. I mean, there's, I mean, or at least it's been adopted by the Republican Party over the last few years. I would, I would be extremely hesitant to say that the Tea Party is representing a popular area. I mean, you know, like seventy percent of Americans oppose the mandate. That's true. This is not just, this is not just fringe people. No, no, I agree, and I, and I broke that point that I accept. I mean, they can't, we can't fight the whole But there's something, but there's something to the also that that all, not all the pieces of the of the healthcare law were um, were opposed. Significant portion of them were properly supported. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like it's much more nuanced. Like you seem to suggest that um, the popular the popular voice says we want a more originalist interpretation of the Constitution. But I'm not convinced that that is the case, or at least not on the federalism grounds that you seem to be thinking uh, popular support is behind. Mm -hmm. Like that's a very nuanced position that, mm -hmm. um, that the federal government doesn't have the ability to do this, and state governments might. Um, it's a very nuanced position, and I didn't. That's not what I heard from the cries of, of kind of like even what we were seeing in the majority. I don't, I don't think people who in the seventy percent said, "I think on, I think on federalism grounds they can't do this." Okay, and and I, I think Ily, Ily Sillman's written about this in the point of political ignorance, uh, and I, I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave that to him. And actually, that's Edward Williams. Said, uh, yours is actually one of the better ones. I actually really liked your paper, uh, and I, th I think you make a <laughs> no, no, I did. <laughs> No, I, I no, I thought he made I thought he made very fair points, and so now I, I I digest it and I can respond to them. So the when you're trying to, oh, can I respond to this? Can I add a quick question? Of course. Can you talk about your methodology? Let's keep let well, man, why don't we? Well, there was a lot in in, 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 in uh, I, I I can weave it in, and and, we, and then we'll and then we'll get to Meg's question. Okay, actually, let me try and kill two birds. I think I think they're, they're, they 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 piggyback. So 
I think you had, had one line in your in your um, in your in your paper. There's nothing wrong with the, with the narrative except that every point he makes seems to fit a storyline. Um, I I think my response to that would be. I was able to observe a lot of these things happening in real time. And I observed them from an interesting vantage point because I was actually clerking at the time. And I had to forcefully keep myself distanced from the actual litigation. Um, had I not been clerking, I'd probably been much more involved than I was. So I, I blog a lot, but actually if you look at my blog, I had nothing about this case from Oak 3 as well as clerking. So I, I had to force myself. And I will admit, at the outset, I was very skeptical of Professor Barnett's arguments. I was extremely skeptical. And to go to your point, I didn't think that it had legs. Um, I still don't know if it has legs. I mean, in all honesty, even up until the day the case was decided, I was actually on the fence of what I thought would happen, what I wanted to happen. I, I was actually, um, I remember telling a friend, like, I'm legitimately worried that this can become an election issue and, and, and this will become very bad. So I'm not coming from this as, as someone who's trying to force um, a specific narrative. Um, rather, this is simply how I viewed what happened. I viewed how, at the outset, progressive professors and opponents of this law were extremely dismissive about this. But that didn't last very long. And something changed. There are lots of constitutional arguments that make no sense that go nowhere. But something about this argument was able to capture people. I don't know if it was just a simple saying broccoli. I don't know if it's simple saying the government can't force you to have inactivity. But something about this happened. Under most circumstances, when a president passes a landmark piece of legislation, that's usually the end of the story. He had both houses. He had a very popular support. This was his mandate, no pun intended. But something happened. What happened is what I try to draw from this narrative. And when I go through the chronology of almost three years of events and the evolution of the thinking on both sides, what it seems to me is that people start realize, wait a minute, our country isn't what we thought it was. Our Constitution isn't where we thought it was in 2009, where we could just pass this law and Speaker Pelosi can say, are you kidding me about constitutional challenges? That's what people thought it was. But that's not where it is anymore. It changed. It moved. And what my narrative is saying is how it moved. You might disagree with me about the sequence of events, but I think you have to agree that something changed and something moved. And we are not in the same place we were in 2009. And that is the gestalt Professor Solomon's referred to. That is the shift, this change, this metamorphosis. And you might differ with me over the degree or, or, or extent of it, but something happened, and it happened quick. And this is, I think, one of the first stabs at trying to pin it down. And I, and I welcome competing narratives. I, 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 I mean that generally. I don't think I have all the right answers. Um, I know I don't. You know, I'm, just, I'm just some guy with a blog. But I think this does make a certain amount of sense if you view it in this large perspective. So I hope I've answered both of your questions. So I actually, I think you've answered uh, I don't know. What do you mean process? I'm sorry? I, I, I mean, for my book, I've done over 75 interviews with everyone from, like, Jack Balkan. I'm talking to Neil Katyal tomorrow. I mean, I've, I've, I've Martin, Martin Leader, I'm seeing later today. I've, I've talked to just about everyone. Reva Siegel, I mean, uh, Bob Post. Jesus. I mean, look at, look at Professor Solomon's legal theory blog. I probably talked to most of the people who are linked there. Um, I, I, I've done a significant amount of research on this case, um, and I... I was actually working on an article on popular constitution before this case even came out, and I was able to largely contribute it. I mean, before this even started, I was working on something on popular constitution and libertarianism. I was talking about the Second Amendment context, but how the Heller case came about. And then once this happened, I was like, oh, wow, that's a new medium. So I've been reading this stuff for, for a while. Um, I've talked to Balkan for hours on this. Um, so I, I, I've tried my best. Uh, I think I did cite Professor Solomon's SSRN piece, the Gestalt, because that's not been published yet. Uh, and as far as a difference between restraint and deference, uh, that's a good question. Let me, let me get out there. I'll think about some more. Uh, was Brown v. Board conservative or liberal using your definition of those terms? Oh, hmm. Was Brown v. Board conservative? I, I don't think Brown. Do you mean uh, judicial conservative or constitutional conservative? Is that, the, is that what you're asking? I mean, I mean, the, the position in, in Brown that would have been conservative was the position of William Rehnquist as a law clerk, where he says, no, we keep Plessy. That would probably have been the conservative position, uh, but no one, no one bit that. Um, although, one interesting thing about Brown is Brown didn't actually do that much. If you actually read Brown, it was actually very constrained. It didn't desegregate school, it said, with all deliberate speed. And it took another five or six or seven years of other opinions to kind of do the dirty work. 
So in many respects, Brown was more conservative than, than most people will give credit for. Sir. Well, I think I think the uh, I don't know what will happen in the future, and I use this kind of analogy. If I were to ask any of you in 1999, what's the next big Supreme Court case? You have never said you'll decide the Florida election. You have just, that would have never thought to you. If I were to ask you in 2000, you know, September 10, 2001, what's the next big case? Guantanamo will have never been on your mind. You know, if I would have asked you, you know, in uh, 2004, what's the next big case? No one would think about the Second Amendment. That had been a dead letter for 70 years. If I had asked Randy on like November say, 11th, 2009, what's going to be the next big case? No one would think about the mandate. I mean, the, 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 the reason why I can answer the question is you never know what the Constitution will, will lead. What we do know is how things start, settle now and how they settled a couple years ago. And to go back to, to that, his question, things are slightly different now than they were before. How this portends for the future, I don't know. That's why we say the Gestalt is unsettled. I haven't said the Gestalt settles somewhere else. It hasn't, like, migrated. It's just in flux. Uh, it, it's in a state of change, and it's not crystallized as we had thought it was. There were, there were several other um, um, papers that discussed uh, the Gestalt. Um, uh, uh, John, you had a question about the Gestalt, and Joe, uh, your paper talked a little bit about the Gestalt. Maybe we, uh, do you want to follow that up? Sure. Uh, thanks a lot. But me, my question was really on how far you had to go. And so I didn't believe that Professor Solom went quite as far as you did in his paper. So I thought he had signified that we had rocked the existing, uh, what he described as a constitutional gestalt, or the, the, the theory as it is. But I don't think that he was going as far as to say that we've actually established a new one. And I don't think I said, I think you misread what I wrote. Did you use the word crystallize? I think you see this in that quote. Is that your paper? Yeah. I, th I, think, I think it was in a slightly different context. I think what I said in that sentence was, the New Deal settlement had crystallized, and now that crystallization has been unsettled. I think that's, I think there was a slight, maybe I, I wrote it in a confusing manner. But I, I don't think this new settlement has crystallized at all. I don't. Um, and to go back to your question, sir, I, I think it's going to take the next case to see what this means. Um, or, or, but the more likely effect is not the next case, but the next president who's thinking about doing something will think twice. That's kind of like a, the sort of Damocles, so to speak. It's not, you know, it doesn't need to get to one first street. It can stop at 1600. Because saying, wait a minute, maybe we shouldn't do this. You know, if you were giving President Obama advice back in 2009, maybe you said, maybe we should just make this a tax. You know, forget political. You know, let's just make this a tax. And then we would have been out. We, we would have been done. If, if they did this, like, you know, there's this great story uh, Francis Perkins related years ago. She was a, a secretary of uh, the Labor Department during the New Deal. And she tells this great story that when FDR was considering Social Security, they didn't know how they can do it through the Commerce Clause. And then she went to a party, and she bumped into then Justice Hughes. And they were just chit-chatting. It was a tea party. and <laughs> No pun intended. But they were just chit-chatting. And she goes to Justice Hughes, you know, we have, this, we have this law. We don't know how to do it. And then Hughes goes and quotes something like, my dear, the tax and power is all you need. And as the lawyer goes, she ran back to the Labor Department and said, you got to make this a tax. It makes a tax. And in Helvering, the Supreme Court said, you can hold this as a tax. This is a choice that President Obama did not make. He did not want to raise taxes because that was his campaign promise. He, another one of his campaign promises was no individual mandate. Go back and look at the debate between him and Hillary in 2008. It's hilarious. Hillary says, we need a mandate. And Obama says, no, we will not force people to have health care. It's actually really funny. But he said, we will not raise taxes. So he made a decision. We'll do this under commerce. And at the time, no one in the White House thought this was even conceivably constitutionally deficient. The House of Representatives made no findings whatsoever about constitutionality. Uh, to answer your question, I've talked to people at ACS, and they drafted a number of the findings for the Senate about why this was constitutional. I talked to the guy who wrote them. Um, and they insist, like, listen, you've got to do this, because this is not as settled as you think it is. But there was this almost a hubris, so to speak, of that this is fine. Today, that hubris is gone. Yes, sir. Uh, I was the other guy who wrote about this stuff. Thank you. And my question to you is, what do you think about a case like Lopez Parson standing up for uh, some of his cases went through and already shattered the New Deal? Mm -hmm. Some mm -hmm. 
No, and I think this goes to a point Professor Barnett has made, was it, it's not that Lopez and Mo this is what I think people don't get about the new federalism. They didn't reverse the New Deal. They simply said this far but no farther, without justification. In other words, Lopez and Morrison didn't reverse Wickard. They didn't reverse Darby or, or Jones or Lachlan. They didn't reverse any of those cases. They said, this is something further than what, what the New Deal court allowed. So when we get to Raich, they're saying, listen, this is controlled by Wickard. You're not outside the New Deal sphere. So you win, the governor. Because in, in, in Wickard, I'm sorry, Raich, Professor Barnett had to justify why this was unconstitutional. He had the burden. Go listen to the arguments in the Supreme Court. Who had the burden? It was the government. Very hostile, but the government had the burden, and they failed. Well, no, they, they, they won. They, they, were, they were saved by grace, I suppose. But, they, this, but, the, but the argument was framed as, Solicitor General, what is your argument? Why do you satisfy this burden? And that's how the entire litigation was, was styled. Uh, someone made a point saying, I shouldn't be focusing on the litigation style, but I should focus on the outcome. I think that's a fair point, but it's very likely that the outcome wasn't what it was, um, which might be, might be important enough as it is. But I'm trying to just see how the case was postured from the outset, that it was framed in terms of the government satisfying this burden at all levels of litigation. Uh, since McDonald closed the door on PRI clause, should the originalists assert non original arguments? Okay. Uh, You know, you know John, I'm sorry. I'm going to interview you. Josh, could you shut down the... the oh, chat? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This is my... Uh, my it, it, sorry. Um, I'm just... I'm finding it... I'm facing the other way, and also I'm finding it very disconcerting. Okay, so, it's off. Um, I just... If you could shut down the chat. It's off. That would be better for me. Okay. 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 Yeah, and that's a, that's a tricky question. I mean, substance of due process has gotten a very bad name um, because of all the years that, that, you know, it's been just attacked. Um, Tim Sandifer had a book, uh, The Rights on Honest Living, and there are other scholars who have said that substance of due process does have a historical pedigree. Perhaps not so much in 1787, but in 1868, that the notion that due process, that substance, was valid. Um, this might be what Professor Solomon's called an originalism second best, that if we can't go PRI, we have to accept due process. And um, we're not going to say this, the Bill of Rights should not be incorporated at all because we've done it incorrectly. Um, and if I, if I can lead into another point, that even though we know Slaughterhouse is wrong, and the four justices the majority of McDonald effectively conceded that Slaughterhouse was wrong, and the four dissenters in just, uh, the four dissenters in McDonald really couldn't say anything against Slaughterhouse. No one rebutted Justice Thomas. I, I think that's, that's a slight realization that, listen, like, whoopsie, we made a mistake, but we're not going to go back. And unlike federalism and commerce clause cases, there's not much fertile ground left for incorporation. There just isn't. Um, I think the Seventh Amendment and the, uh, the, the, the unanimous verdict clause and a couple other clauses haven't been incorporated, but there's just not much left there. In fact, the Supreme Court denied cert in a unanimous verdict clause that was challenging Apodaca about a year or two ago. Uh, Eugene Volokh had the cert petition on that. But the, um, but the general notion is that is not quite as big of a deal as it is for federalism because there are ways the government can go further and try and expand their powers. Yes, sir. Um, one of my criticisms was maybe an over-attribution to originalism and under-attribution to popular originalism. So you, you mentioned how important it was that it was set to 7% on popular and Professor Barnett said the Tea Party, you know, ground level support was important. So I'm, I'm curious if, if you think that the case would have gotten nearly as far as the favorability of the rate is 7% rather than 7 it, it would have gone, I don't think it would have gone very far. Um, I think I made this point somewhere that uh, that had it not had this popular support behind it, it wouldn't have gotten to the you know wouldn't have gone to the starting line. I think that's right. It, there are lots of crazy constitutional challenges that start every day. I mean, you guys are really smart lawyers. You're, you'll you know you'll be lawyers in a year or so. You come up with some pretty smart constitutional arguments, but unless someone's willing to buy it, you're not going anywhere. And th this is I think is a, a capture well between a Balkan Barnett blog exchange that a lot of these where Jack said uh, where, where Professor Balkan said. Um, Professor Barnett is not trying to just convince you you're right. He's right. He's also trying to convince you that this idea is non-frivolous. So there's this idea that 
in order to bring the idea from off the wall to on the wall, you need to simultaneously convince people that this argument has merit and it's accepted. You need both of those at the same time. It's not enough to just say an argument has merit. You need to see that people are accepting it. And because people accept it, that means it has merit. There's this chicken and the egg feed feedback loop. Um, and that's something that was done very quickly. And I don't think... Republicans, Tea Party, there were established elements of society yearning and craving for a constitutional uh, 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 vision. Um, and at the same time, they had uh, uh, this opportunity with the ACA to go after it. Original scholars got it to the point where you know, like Professor Barnett got it to the point of being ex acceptable, but really popular in constitutionalism. Well, I think I think that's what scholars do, um, and, and I don't say that lightly. But there's a reason why people spend their entire lives studying an area of law and are considered experts. So when a politician says, "Hey, what about this this provision?" they can call a scholar. Um, and I think that, that 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 that's that's a good thing when. You know, usually people on the Hill don't really listen to professors very much. They, they kind of scoff at them, and people on the court kind of scoff at them. But they don't scoff so much when the arguments they make help to understand the Constitution and advance arguments. Um, I, I think Professor Barnett and others played an invaluable role, uh, sorry, an extremely valuable role in advancing this idea, uh, because without the intellectual groundwork, I mean, if you look at the legislative history, when this law first began, the arguments were so crude, and they were so unrefined. You know, so the Congress can't regulate inactivity. You know, it was a very simple argument, but would not get very far. So then there were nuances. Professor Barnett, Todd Gaziano, Nate Stewart, they had this entire heritage paper that said, well, it's not just inactivity or activity, it's classes of activities. They looked to the language of race, and they said, okay, how does this fit in with race? And they developed a nuance argument. The tax argument, that was something that had to be developed. You know, uh, whether it was a facial and as applied challenge, these are very discrete decisions that had to be made and, and thankfully people with experience were able to make these decisions. So it would not be enough to just hire, uh, you know, you know, have a Republican hire Paul Clements and just grace, grace, go straight for it. You need to develop these ideas at the outset. Is your hand up, Mr. Bernard? Yeah, I, I just wanted to explore this, but I'm not sure I understood the question completely. I thought maybe you could elaborate a little yeah. more about what you are positing as the relationship between what you're calling originalist scholarship and what you're calling popular constitutionalism. I just didn't quite get the whole point. Yeah, so I probably didn't articulate it that well, but I meant, so since you and the other challengers didn't advance an explicitly originalist argument, my question was, you as an originalist, originalist scholar did, you know, have a lot of the, drove a lot of the success of the litigation, but since you didn't advance um, an originalist argument is more of a win for libertarianism and the things that originalists try to achieve, like libertarianism, rather than a win for originalism as a method of constitutional interpretation. Didn't, didn't you, ask, were you, did you ask in your paper about sort of whether it was originalist full? Or maybe that was... What, what's your name, sir? I, I have my notes here. Okay, let me bring it up. It was Zach. Zach. Yeah, Zach had, Zach had a comment in his paper about sort of a, a variation of this question, which is, was originalism sort of operating in the background as a force? And I think you're, you're maintaining in the paper that it was, right? So, so, so there's this question, sort of, was originalism sort of operating in the background, uh, uh, pulling the justices uh, uh, towards the specific doctrinal arguments that were made um, uh, to the Supreme Court, for example, or in the lower courts, right? That would be one theory is that, that, that originalism was significant even though it was off stage. And then another account may be, might be something like, well, you know, original, originalism wasn't playing a role here, it wasn't in the briefs, uh, there wasn't that much uh, uh, there, there, there really wasn't a focus at all that something else was doing the work and that the theory there might be that it was popular constitutionalism that this was opposition to the legislation and um, uh, sort of the appeal of the argument that mandates mm -hmm. were different that that's what was really doing mm -hmm. 
time that you practice this? And I'm not sure I, this is really very complicated, and I'm not sure I know exactly how much of which was playing at what time. I, I think this idea that originalism, first of all, originalism played no role in that Josh accurately reports in the litigation, any of the public, most of the public argumentation, but I do think it played a role, it has played a role for many years in uh, delegitimizing the unlimited reading of the of the New Deal settlement, which is mm -hmm. that which is the law professor's reading, and was in fact some judges' reading in the past, which is that with respect to the national economy, Congress has unlimited political power, to do it, subject only to express constraints like the Bill of Rights and an unenumerated right like privacy or something. But other than that, Congress can do it. That was the law professor's reading, beginning with. The new federalism that was arrested, but I think it was arrested because, at least by the 90s, when OPEP was decided, the original, uh, the fact that the New Deal had gone beyond the original meaning was considered both true and generally acknowledged by everybody. And it always has been, and bad. So it's not only true, but also not great. That didn't mean anybody was prepared to repeal it or go back. In fact, I think. Most conservative judges just, and justices are simply not. Only Justice Thomas, I think, would be prepared to do something like that. One justice. Um, but it does exert, I think, in the background, this kind of gravitational force where it basically says, fine, you can go as far as you want. We're not, we're not going back on that. We're not going to pull it back. But if you want to go farther than that, sort of escape and go farther than that, you don't, don't get an automatic pass to do that. If you listen to... The law professors who said this challenge was frivolous in day one, their view was, what are you talking about? Are you serious? That's Pelosi, but that's the, are you serious? Of course, you, you, it's a national economy, it's an economic regulation. You don't understand, you can do whatever you want. That, that's, that's the law. But it wasn't, it turns out. It wasn't the law. What was really more the law of five justices, not six, but of five justices was because of this fundamental illegitimacy that has that seed has now been planted. If you want to go farther, you better justify it. And by the way, this far, no farther. Uh, and Josh doesn't I think he gets this right in the paper. It isn't literally you cannot go farther. It's just that the burden is on you to justify if you go farther. So it's not it's not like there is a line and we will not let you go. Right. But, it, but what we're not going to allow is unlimited power. If your argument, if the basis of your argument leads to unlimited power, but that's not a position we're prepared to accept. That was what Drew Days found out in his oral argument in the Lopez case. And that's been true now since 1995. So at, what was up in the air is whether that had ended with Chief Justice Rehnquist's death and Justice O'Connor's retirement and whether and the Rage case. And the law professors have reverted to their previous view that said, no, no, we were right all along. It's anything goes. And now they thought going into this case that was. So originalism there in the background doing important work, but not in the foreground in really any way, shape, or form. It is it's already shaped the battle space for 20 years. And with another, you know, with another retirement and another appointment, that battle space will be changed again. But is that is that an answer to the question? Yeah. So it is it, it's sort of like a, a spectrum almost. You have the law professor's version uh, on all Coincidentally, on the left side and on the right side, you have originalism, libertarian outcome, and the new federal federalism cases pushed pushed it closer to the 